Thank you for inviting me down here again. And the uh, usual comment from me, people say, you're giving the talk today? Yes, but stay anyway. Yeah. Okay, so there we go. All right. There. All right. Well, praise the Lord. So, just saying to Sid, this can be a very short talk. Is communion important? The answer is yes. Yeah, yeah that's right. So, uh, but I might, might try to explain why. Okay. Okay, all right. John chapter 6, John's Gospel chapter 6. And <clears throat> presumably, um, the, uh, behind the question is, is it important to get there on Sunday to the communion service? And, um, well, it is. But um, anyway, just to see where, how really important and vital that it is, we read a little bit what Jesus said here in John 6, verse 40, 48. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness, but they're dead. So um, there's a prelude to all of this. Uh, Jesus had performed a miracle earlier and, uh, and people followed him around because he uh, um, you know, brought this, uh, multiplied the loaves and fishes and so on. And then they got talking about Moses and everything. He said, well, you had a miracle in the time of Moses, um, but it was only for the short term because uh, people died anyway. Uh, this is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. Like he said, he is the bread of life, and if you, if you eat me, well, um, you, you're going to have eternal life. I'm the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread which I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And you can imagine the, the reaction that uh, they got there, and I think many of us would have had a similar reaction. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Is he inviting us to be cannibals? And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. So that gives the answer. This is how vital this is. You've got to eat of, uh, of, the, of the, the, the bread and of the, of the cup. You've got to eat of the, the, the flesh and, and of the blood of Jesus um, if, if you want to live forever. Uh, and then Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me, and I in him. And as the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eats me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He keeps on repeating this. He that eats of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples when they heard this said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? And then Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it. He said, does this offend you? And so even the disciples uh, couldn't understand what this was all about. They probably think he's really lost at this time. And he said, what? And if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. So he was preparing them. He said, well, if you can't accept what I'm saying about this, what's going to happen in the near future when uh, I'm rocketing up to heaven? Uh, what are you going to think then? And then he goes on to say, it is the Spirit that quickens, that gives life. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So it was all about this having a spiritual application and uh, this was only, of course, to be possible when Jesus had paid the price for our sins and he'd been raised from the dead and uh, he uh, was sent back to heaven 
and then the Holy Spirit would come down and make all of these things uh, and make sense to them and so on. So uh, there we go. So that's that point. Now if we go to 1 Corinthians 11, which uh, most of us are very familiar with, about uh, the communion service, and I'm taking you there uh, because um, it does particularly spe specify about it being a remembrance. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, of course, it's uh, quoting uh, what uh, Jesus said. Well, Paul had it revealed to him because he wasn't there with the other uh, apostles. He was um, in the other camp uh, when Jesus uh, was betrayed and, and the, the Last Supper and so on. Um, and he said in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 11, For I have received of the Lord, this is Paul saying this, that which also I delivered unto you that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup when he had cup sup, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, do you show the Lord's death till he come. And then he went on to say that uh, we're to eat uh, the bread and drink the cup um, if we're doing it uh, unworthily, um, disrespectfully, you will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. This is... Um, this is very important, so therefore we should examine ourselves. Now, um, the reason why we should come to the communion service is because it is there as a reminder to us that Jesus died for our sins. And without that, we had no hope for the future. It was all just a complete waste of time. Uh, but because we do know this, we believe it, we've been sealed with the spirit of promise, as, um, and the Lord continues to reveal the importance of these things. But we need to come to, to the communion service. It is um, it's vital for, to help us because we forget things. And um, so uh, anyway, praise the Lord. So that's that one. But also, I wanted to take you um, back to... Uh, uh, to Where did I put this down here? Oh, yes, chapter 10. Chapter 10 of uh, 1 Corinthians here. And <clears throat> what maybe some people don't realise is that the, um, the Greek word, um, brother, brother were, Brian was saying there before that he thought Nicomanetitis was giving the talk today. I said, well, I'm going to mention a Greek word, but that's about the only thing likeness that you'll get, and I probably won't pronounce it right anyway. Uh, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 10... Uh, it talks about communion. And uh, <clears throat> what maybe people don't all realise is that the same word that is translated as communion in other places is translated as fellowship. And so, uh, which makes sense because the communion is a common union. You have things in common. And, and fellowship is, um, well, somebody once sent, well, Fellowship's good, but we want more fellows in the ship. So uh, um, we want more ladies as well. Anyway, so, but it's a, a koinonia is uh, the Greek word. I think that's right. But it means a partnership or a, a fellowship is a similar word used when you read in the Gospels about uh, uh, Peter and Andrew, James and John. They were partners in the, in the fishing industry and so when one of them got too many fish and the boat was starting to sink he called his mates over to uh, uh, <clears throat> to share in the in the the the, um, the booty okay <clears throat> so um yeah so where are we here um in, in first corinthians 10 um well it's it starts off i'll just put it in its context Go from verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that our fathers, the ancestors, were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptised uh, into Moses in the cloud in the sea. And uh, we know the story, the pillar of fire by night and pillar of cloud by day. 
and uh, this was uh, the Spirit of God uh, brooding over them and so on. And it was a type of baptism in the Holy Spirit and the waters um, of the Red Sea that all um, eat the same spiritual meat and drink the same spiritual drink. Well, they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. So even in the Old Testament, there is the uh, spiritual connection looking forward to the coming of Jesus Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. And then he goes on to say that these things were examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they lusted. So even though they had their deliverance, they, were, um, <coughs> uh, they still strayed. And that's a warning. And it says that's an example to us. We've had our deliverance. We've had our... Uh, Red Sea experience, if you like, of uh, going through the waters of baptism, receiving the Holy Spirit, the, 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 cl the fire, the cloud uh, over us and so on. But he goes on to say that, that, that these people, in spite of all the miracles that happened, they got uh, sidetracked and they were uh, involved in other things and they, uh, um, they had, well, it talks of... Uh, uh, of lust, it talks of uh, idolatry, it talks of fornication, talks of murmuring, and all of these things that uh, sidetrack people from the wonderful um, deliverance that uh, God had given to them and uh, the promise of uh, going into the promised land. So we, in one sense, have still got to get to the promised land of the, when the Lord comes back, and we've got to learn from their mistakes that we don't make similar ones. Uh, to make sure that we uh, we make it there, um, <clears throat> and um, uh, so we'll, we'll read on a bit more. Verse eleven, it says, uh, "Now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world have come. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall." In other words, this is important. Don't take it lightly. There is no temptation taken you such as is common to man. Other people get tempted. But God is faithful and will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but with the temptation make a way to escape that you can bear it. So we're going to have hard times, but God will be there with us. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry, false religion. Keep away from that. I speak to you as wise men, judge what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So we are sharing in the benefit that Jesus said, if we eat of his, his body and drink of his blood, we're going to have eternal life. And so the cup that we, that we uh, partake of, well, uh, it is... The, uh, the body and blood of, of Jesus Christ and all the benefits that go with it. Uh, for we being one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. And so this is why it talks about the communion. It's a, a common union that drives us together. We're all there for this one purpose. And he goes on to say in, uh, in verse... Um, where do I put my notes down here for some reason? Um, yeah, we'll read on a bit more. Uh, it says, For we are made one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Wherefore, behold Israel after the flesh, are, are they not they which eat of the sacrifices, partakers of the altar, talking of the priests and, and the Old Testament? What say it then? that the idol is anything or that which is offered to a sacrifice to idols is anything. And so he gets on then to, to, uh, to start talking about uh, people who, who have false religion, false idols and so on. For I say that the things that the, G the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And would not that you should have fellowship with devils. And so he was talking about fellowship, talking about communion, how we have our communion with each other, partaking of the body and blood of Jesus Christ and all the benefits that go from that. But the, the Gentiles that, uh, that enticed Israel in the Old Testament to, to go after their, their idols and their uh, fleshy ways and so on, well, we will be enticed as well 
and even here when you think about it, this is written to the Corinthians and of course the, uh, the Greeks of that particular era were into all sorts of idol worship. You think of Acts 17 when Paul came to, uh, to Athens and the place was just full of idols everywhere and philosophies and so on. So he goes on to say a little bit more here um, that the Gentiles, they sacrifice to devils. That's what they're doing and not to God. I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. So don't get drawn aside. You have this wonderful opportunity to commune with each other and uh, particularly with the Lord Jesus Christ. When you come to your communion service and you're remembering all of these things, don't get sidetracked by going to others and don't get sidetracked by letting them bring their stuff, their, their error, their falseness, their, well, devilish um, um, practices into your fellowship. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do you, we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. So the Lord has set us free. We're not under the law, the law anymore, but he also has filled us with the Spirit to give us the wisdom to be able to discern between good and evil, to know what to partake of and what to abstain from. And so this is um, the, the fellowship we're talking about here. Um, just uh, another little uh, thing about um, the, the, the Greek word. It's another interesting word. This, the, the one we've been talking about is koinonia, uh, but there's another one that sounds very similar to it. It's called uh, koinos, and um, that is uh, uh, also it has the, the aspect of, uh, of uh, being... Uh, something that is, is common and it's actually translated that way in the book of Acts you might recall the story when uh, uh, Peter was being told that he should go down to uh, Joppa um, and, to, uh, and to see uh, the household of, Cor of Cornelius and that the, the, the Lord was, uh, gave him a vision and he sent these, um, uh, Peter was, had been fasting and he got hungry, that's what happens when you fast and, uh, and so the, uh, the, there was this great sheet came down from heaven and there was all sorts of, uh, of um, uh, different animals in there and of course uh, they were listed as being unclean uh, under the Old Testament law and uh, so I did write a bit of a list of them there somewhere but anyway I don't know whether you want to know about all of that but there was all of these uh, what did I do with it? It probably is, here it is somewhere in, in the book of Acts. So here we got, uh, these were some of the things that were probably in it. Um, some of you might like eating some of these things. We're not under law anymore, but camels. I don't know if anyone's eaten a camel lately. Uh, hares, whatever they are. Um, rabbits, pigs, weasels, mice, tortoises, ferrets. Chameleons, lizards, snails, moles, eagles, vultures, ravens, owls, hawks, cuckoos, cormorants, swans, pelicans, hawks, herons, bats, and storks. Remember Pastor Jock talking about this once. And um, at that particular time, uh, we'd just been having a bit of a rush in the crate, and he thought it might be an idea if somebody did eat the stork. But anyway, uh, so, uh, yeah. So, all right, now where do we get to here? Um, so, that was, uh, Peter said, I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And this, of course, for the, uh, for the Israelites, it was part of the reason why they were not to eat certain things because God wanted to show there was a difference between Israel and the rest of the people round about. And uh, so, it was common because it was something which uh, the people were, were in unity over. It, you can all partake of this. And so that's what happens when you have something that is common in the sense of that word, where uh, it's, uh, well, you go to the lowest common denominator, which means that um, 
you know, anybody's accepted there, no matter what they believe and what they, they do and so on. Well, the Lord says that's having, that's having fellowship with devils if, if you're doing that. It, it's, it's a strictness and some people don't like the strictness that we have. But I think all of us here are very glad about the strictness that we have here because it's, it's a freedom within the boundaries that the Lord sets and we have wonderful freedom within those boundaries and uh, people who uh, want to be free finish up putting themselves under bondage. Anyway, <coughs> that's that. Um, <clears throat> all right, now um, i just like to refer a little bit to First uh, Corinthians uh, chapter... Uh, well done with it. First Corinth, uh, no, Second Corinthians chapter 8. Here it is, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Don't go away. Hope you're still all eating. Otherwise you have to have your mask on, don't you? Yeah, anyway. Sorry, I shouldn't have brought that up. Um, <coughs> okay, 2 uh, Corinthians uh, chapter 8, just one aspect about communion and, and, and fellowship, which are, as I said, are, are the same thing, it's the same word that's used in the, in the original Greek. Um, talking about Nicomanetitis, I think he is the original Greek, but anyway. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 3, I read, uh, For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their record they are willing of themselves, praying us with, with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did not as we hope, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Now, what this is about is that the, uh, the people that he's writing to here in Corinth, which is, is I think is an amazing turnaround. The first letter that he wrote to the Corinthians, he was telling them off every second chapter sort of thing about um, the things that they were doing wrong and uh, their selfish behaviour but here they've had such a huge turnaround that when they heard about the the uh, the saints in Jerusalem uh, you know were well starving I guess they just wanted to help and so he, um, he t said that uh, and I want to read it out of the Amplified uh, from verse um, 4 um, well, I'll start from verse 3 again. For as I, as I can bear witness, they gave according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, and they did it voluntarily, begging us more insistently for the favour and the fellowship, the fellowship of contributing in this ministration for the relief and support of the saints in Jerusalem. No, nor was this gift of theirs merely the contribution we expected, but first they gave themselves to the Lord and to us as his agents by the will of God that is entirely disregarding their personal interests. They gave as much as they possibly could, having put themselves at our disposal to be directed by the will of God. And so I think that explains it a little bit better that um, they, not, <coughs> they heard about the other saints <coughs> in a different region. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and so they wanted to help and they, they, they offered a, a contribution uh, but Paul said look they went far beyond that as much as they possibly could uh, uh, they could and, uh, and this was uh, described as being uh, the fellowship of contributing uh, to the administration of the relief of these other saints so that's, uh, <clears throat> that's again where the, the word fellowship is used, their communion here, uh, having it in common. And, and, and that's the feeling we have in our fellowship around the world. And uh, whenever we hear that there's been a, um, a, a, a cyclone in Vanuatu and people's houses are knocked over and, they're, and they're, you know, they're, we've heard about Nepal and people put their hands in their pocket to help to... Uh, uh, to send some money which we were able to do to help to feed the saints over there in Nepal and so on. The same sort of thing, that's, that's the, the fellowship, that's the communion. And even though we'll never meet 
a lot of these people this side of the Lord's coming, well, we know we're in fellowship with them and, uh, and, and we, we share. We want to uh, give of our abundance to, to help them as well. Okay, <clears throat> so the... Um, uh, so part of the uh, the thing about the communion is not just remembering the broken body of the Lord and the shed blood, but also <coughs> of coming together. And in 1 Corinthians 11, we're reading from Egoan in chapters 12, 13 and 14. And it talks there in chapter 14 and verse 26, it talks of when you come together that you have... Uh, I might just make sure I read that right... 1 Corinthians 14, 26. How is it, brethren, when you come together, every one of you has a psalm, has a doctrine, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation, let all things be done unto every edifying. I'm just wanting to make the point that this was the, the, what they did as a church. They came together for the communion service, but they also came together for the ministry of the word and for the gifts to operate and all this sort of thing. And uh, so <clears throat> it was uh, the, the point I'm wanting to make here is the coming together. This, this is what communion is about. It's not just remembering the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me again. Okay, let's try and wind down. We'll go to First John chapter 1 and we're considering a bit more here about uh, how the, the, the word koinonia is, is what is used here to describe this wonderful passage about fellowship. And we start off in 1 John chapter 1, and we read verse 1, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Um, yes, it's sort of uh, modern translations put this a little bit uh, uh, clearer. It's actually saying... Uh, this is talking about the Word of God, uh, Jesus Christ, who, who came into this world. Well, these people are writing this, but Paul, uh, uh, John rather, who is writing this, he said, well, we, we, we've seen him, we've actually heard him, we've actually touched him, and so on. Uh, For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. He said, that man that we followed around for those three years, he, uh, he came from the Father. He was the Word made flesh. And, uh, and so we know what we're talking about here. And he says, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. You might have communion with us. Even though you weren't there, we were. We bring the testimony. And truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his son Jesus Christ. So we actually had fellowship with him when he was here uh, in the flesh, but we continue to have fellowship with him now through the Spirit. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. And this is the message <clears throat> that we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Again, emphasizing the point, we don't want to bring any having... Um, uh, fellowship with devils, with, with false religion or compromise and so on. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Or if you like, we're having communion with one another. Uh, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So this is how we drink of the blood of Christ and uh, his cleansing power as, as we walk in the light, as, uh, as he is in the light and we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. We don't deceive anyone else. Everyone reels around about, no, we're sinning, uh, but, uh, uh, but we, we're just fooling ourselves. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Amazing how many people think that they don't need a saviour, but we all do. It reads straight on, uh, My little children, these things write unto you, that you sin not. So be good boys and girls. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, 
the righteousness, and he is the propitiation for our sins. He is the, the, um, the sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. So that's the key to it all, is keep walking uh, in, in the light as he is in the light, and so on. And I'll just finish up with a, a couple of uh, other quotes. If we go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, the very last, um, very last uh, words in the book of 2 Corinthians. Um, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. And I've got one other quote as well. If we, uh, if we go to Hebrews and chapter 10, and just to remind it to us, I think it's very applicable in our time. Now, I know that at this stage we're a bit confused about whether to go to a meeting or not, whether we're breaking the law of the land or not, if we go and... Uh, got to wear masks and all those sort of things. But um, um, here in, second, in, in Hebrews chapter 10, um, we read in verse 21, Having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We've been purified by the Spirit washing through us, and uh, we've been, uh, our sins have been washed away through the blood of Christ. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. And so that's part of what, what happens uh, by us being together, having fellowship, having communion, getting to, together in the meetings and so on, because we're actually provoking each other in a nice way. Some people think it's, it's good fun to provoke people, just keep prodding them, but be careful you're not poking the bear. Anyway, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. And what is concerning me a little bit um, is that whereas on the one hand it's great that we've been able to um, still stay in touch through uh, modern means of uh, technology and so on and uh, to stay home if we have to. I know when the first uh, lockdown came and Pastor Chris was down, busy down here and there wasn't even room for, for, for Christine to, to come into the meeting. They were so limited and uh, they, they didn't need me at the Vogue some of the time there. So I was home and I had fellowship with my daughter, which was really nice. We came around and uh, we had communion together and, and, and that was great. But as soon as we were able to get back to meetings, well, that was even greater. But uh, so we enjoy all of that. But it seems that some people, and you might know some of these, who've uh, sort of got used to not coming to meetings and, oh, well, I can still uh, join in online. Now, um, I think even must confess a little bit that I, I listen to a lot of things online these days. On Wednesday night, I, I usually go to Gawler. Uh, it's it's uh, three quarters of an hour drive to get there with Zoom. It only takes me half an hour to work out how to turn the computer on. Uh, so... Uh, but uh, but anyway, that's uh, um, yeah. So, but it, it's you, you sort of find yourself. Whereas the first time, when Christine was coming around, when everybody stood up, we stood up and we sang when they did, and and all that sort of thing. But now sometimes I find myself going off and wandering off and making a cup of tea while they're still going, and that, that's that's I don't think that's a sin, is it? Uh, and uh, and so on. The tea's all right, I believe. Uh, but, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's easy. And I think if people are not getting to meetings, uh, they'll drift away and the next thing they won't be bothered to do anything. So, um, you know, just look out for your friends and, uh, and uh, sort of call them over and, and, uh, and that sort of thing because, as we read it again, 
not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. That is having com the communion is not just remembering the broken body of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's getting together with your brothers and sisters. We need each other. And what they don't realise, um, I have to shout because the people I'm talking about are not here, uh, is they don't realise, oh, I don't really need, I don't really need to come. Well, they do, but we actually need them. And if we can sort of get that across to them, look, we really miss you. We, we, we'd love you to, to be there. So if you can help them, some will resent it. And I think there's some that have decided they're not coming anymore. But um, let's try and save them if we can. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as some do, but exhorting one another, encouraging one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Well, it's here. And uh, so, anyway, praise the Lord. Enough from me.